Hey, what's going on folks? In this lesson, I am going to be talking about SDL timers in our SDL2 C++ programming series. So timers allow you to have events execute that would take place later in the future. So you can imagine this being pretty important in games if you have triggers or certain events that you want to happen later in the game or perhaps even recurring events at a certain interval. So I'm going to show you how to use the timers and what the SDL2 API looks like in this lesson. So let's go ahead and dive in. So before talking about this, just to give you an idea of what's going on with timers on the right hand side of my screen here, basically we have a basic game input loop here where we have the input update events, and then render. But then on occasion, we want to have other events happen, say every milliseconds, where we just call some function. And that could be part of our actual game loop, so we could have a bunch of these timers uh, going off, or it could just be a one-time event that happens later in the future. So this event that's going to happen here is, again, some function call that happens asynchronously, again, 1,000 milliseconds or one millisecond later on. So the mechanism for doing this is SDL timer, and we have a nice API for doing this, SDL add timer. So let me go ahead and just go back one step so you can see the timer API. Again, if you go to the APIs by category uh, from the SDL documentation, so just uh, fast forward you here, you will see this category timers here and then the API. And basically, we're just going to be working with add timer and uh, remove timer for this. We have some other functions that we have looked at previously related to timing, such as adding delay. We're using that to control our frame rate, or at least set a frame cap now, uh, but we're really interested in add timer. Okay, so how do we get started and what does a timer look like? Well, timer itself has to have some interval or delay before that function's called. I'll say interval because that would be if you were adding timers, say, in your game loop, which you certainly could do. And then you'll have a callback function. So this is the function that's going to be called after some time elapses. And then any parameters into that callback function. So for folks who are similar with using the pthread library in C programming or even the thread library in C++, which I have a series about, you can check that out uh, on my channel. This is basically the same idea where you have your function and then just some structure here. It's a void type here with the actual parameters. If you want to pass multiple parameters, you have to pass in some sort of struct into that. Anyway, so let's go ahead and get started with using timers. So the first thing we need to do is initiate our timer here. So you'll notice in our SDL app here, I'm initiating the timer library now. So how are we actually going to use the timing library now? Well, we need to add a timer somewhere. So how I've set this up is this is going to be part of our SDL app. Again, you need not use this abstraction, but I think it will be useful for you in the future here. So I'm going to go ahead into our include and just take a look at the SDL app uh, header here, just so you can get an idea of what this looks like. And I've added some functions here for adding a timer. Uh, if you wanted to add a recurring timer, you could add additional functionality and then removing a timer. And you'll notice that I have specific timer IDs here. So I'm actually going to maintain a collection of timers. I'm using a set data structure because each timer ID is going to be unique uh, for that timer. And the reason for this is if I have a bunch of recurring timers that are going to be running, say, every few seconds in our actual game, then I'll want to be able to remove those timers when the program exits. And this is just to ensure that this is done safely. This goes to the threading point. I'd actually have to dive a little deeper into the SDL code to see what's going on here, but I want to make sure that all of our timers have been removed before the program executes so you don't have a bunch of asynchronous or code running in other functions when your main program might have terminated. That's a little bit confusing to the operating system when that happens and sometimes messes up with how we clean resources. So anyway, that's the design of the API where I'll have a set keeping track of all the timers that I've created. Uh, ability to add a timer and then remove a timer. And then, of course, if you want to expand on this, you can have a recurring timer. So let's go ahead and look at the implementation code, uh, which I have started here. And it's basically a wrapper around the SDL functions for adding and removing timers. So I have a way to remove a timer here, uh, which is just erasing it from that set. Um, and then I have my add timer function, which is just calling add timer. 
Now, with the recurring timer, I was messing around a little bit with adding a timer. Um, and then from the documentation, you can actually create a user event and just push that event into your event loop and handle it. That would be totally fine. That is, again, another way that you can work with timers. In fact, I'll just show you in the actual uh, documentation. This is showing the sort of execution here. And by having user events, um, and perhaps the second is a, a better example here, pushed as a function here, the documentation talks a little bit about multi-threading being a problem, but basically I'm taking events that happen elsewhere at some interval, pushing them into my event loop, and then in my event loop uh, portion of my code, uh, which let's go ahead and uh, open up here um, in our handle events section, here you could have an event type where you look for SDL underscore uh, user event. Again, that's what's shown in the documentation here. And that way you ensure that stuff happens um, without having to worry about concurrency issues of whatever your functions are that you're spawning, touching the same pieces of data, etc., because they've been pushed into this poll. Okay, so let me go ahead and show you how I use it. Then I'll go ahead and wrap up this lesson here. Um, the idea being in our main function, we want to add a timer here that's going to call our callback. Uh, I have to determine what the argument is for that callback function. In this case, it's just going to be a string, a simple C style string here. So let me show you my callback function here. And here it is. And all of our timers have to return some uint32 the interval at which it'll be called, and then any parameters here. So you can see me specifically casting that parameter because it's coming in as a void star. Again, this is very C-based. We could probably use some other C++ constructs. Again, I'll leave that for folks to um, implement if they like. Um, but for now, I'm just going to have the score print out once uh, during the game, uh, start after the second second. Uh, so um, let me go ahead and go in here. And by second, second, I mean after two seconds of actual execution here. So I'll run my build script for this uh, timers example here. And as soon as it finishes building, let's go ahead and run. And you'll notice nothing here, but after two seconds of our game playing, you'll see that this update function was called. Now, again, you can have some sort of event happen uh, for scripting purposes. You could have various triggers that happen at either regular intervals or after a user does something in their game. Again, that's what timers can be used for. And I would encourage folks to think a little bit about the mechanism if you want to have a recurring timer, whether you're pushing that into your event loop to have recurring events that are happening. That could be one method. That's what I've started in the support code and maybe I'll uh, edit it further. Or you could otherwise just simply keep adding timers in your main loop to have events happen after a certain duration. Now you do have to be a little bit careful with the timer delay, which the documentation talks about a little bit, meaning that it might not be exactly 1000 milliseconds. It might be off by a little bit depending on the duration or how long it takes to execute the function. So keep that in mind. So folks, with that said, I hope it's useful for you now to know that there are timers that can be a useful mechanism in your games for triggering events or otherwise working with some sort of concurrency or asynchrony if you need that in your application. And I'm sure you'll think of other cool uses for using timers. So if you found that helpful, make sure to like and subscribe or put a comment below if you have any comments and we'll see you in the next lesson. Take care folks.